All right, gang, what's up? It's Colton Lindsay here, here live in the Masterminds. Let's do a quick check-in. We'll start with Al Torrey. What's your check-in from the last couple of weeks? Uh, all good. We just took uh, two more listings this week, and we Denise just wrote an offer on a buyer yesterday. Uh, we're working on 2019 planning, and uh, so far we're going to fall a little short this year, but it's gonna it's based on buyers that we've had and sellers that have backed out out of our pipeline because of the market. So we're, we're just kind of throwing everything at the wall now. We're prospecting more and we're taking everything in multifamily, business listings, 55 and over condos, everything. And we've, we've ramped up our listings in the last four weeks. Uh, how many, like, I mean, at least five so far this month. So we're doing pretty good. You signed five listings this month? Five listings this month. It's amazing what happens when you go to work, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Denise, what's your check-in with your victories over the last couple of weeks? I think uh, my husband just said it. We've been making our contacts. Um, we've been trying to make our contacts every day. We've been for a schedule. We've been uh, going on more listing appointments and taking more listings and uh, putting the buyers that we have under contract. I know. Cool. Sweet. David. Yeah, so a um, couple wins. I had a closing on a $550,000 house on Monday. It was an expired mm -hmm. listing, by the way. And then I finally, I announced this in, uh, in the mastermind group when I was in Puerto Rico, but I finally officially got assigned on Monday a $1.8 million land listing. So Woo! I'm pretty stoked about that. I had to have to partner with somebody with that because I've never done land before, but, you know, hey, so it is okay. what it is. Yeah, exactly. So tell us, so. where, did that, where did that come from? It was actually a, a referral from a friend. So Awesome, dude. Nice. Cool. So our victory, I'm going to walk away for a second but still talk. Our victory was um, we had some meltdowns with our team this week because we've got a lot of challenging deals going on. And I talked to my team about this, um, and I said, isn't it awesome that we actually have problems to deal with right now because it means we have customers? And so that was our huge victory for our team is because how many of you guys have noticed that the market has tightened up and there's a lot of people complaining about the market right now. Has anyone else noticed that? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was kind of our victory this week is that we have customers and then it's shaping up like October will be either our first or second biggest month of the year, which I'm really excited for. So I thought we'd be close to 90 grand, but we had a couple of deals pushed back to next month. Um, so I think we'll probably be about 75 or 80 grand for the, for the month, which is an awesome month for us. So I'm stoked about that. So that's our victories. So here's what I want to do for the conver conversation day is I want to do a couple hot seats. Al's going to run a hot seat with uh, David. And then afterwards, I want to go. Did you guys get that link I sent in the messenger earlier? Yeah. yeah. So it's really cool article that I wanted to read and discuss together. I think it fits in perfect with where we're at with the market and where we're going um, into 2019. So um, Al, you want to start the hot seat with David? Yeah, it's so cool. Uh, uh, David um, has had a, a ton of growth this year and it's actually quite exciting to see it because uh, I don't know if you remember Colton last year in Miami, we sat down and we did a coaching. You did a coaching with David and, yeah. and do you remember that? Yeah. Yep. And, uh, that was November last year, actually. And, and that went after David walked away, I was like, wow, he reminds me so much of me when I started, like all the energy that you had going on. I was like, you're going to succeed in 2018 even more so. And here we are. So let's talk about this year so far, man. What's, what, what are you stuck on right now? <clears throat> so just business-wise, right? Yeah. So it, well, it, it's I mean, funny. Really. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of stuff I'm stoked on. I'm stoked on. I'm really – these past like three to four weeks, I've really put a focus on health because I'm trying to get my energy to a level 10. So that way I can put that energy to focus into my business at a level 10. I'm really excited about that. And I'm really been excited about the growth I've done since Miami last year. It's funny how my business is completely different now than what it was in November of last year. So I always sit, when I do my smart weeks, I always reflect on where I was like this point last year and, and just very uh, excited about the process and the journey and the growth. So, mm hmm that's awesome, man. So I remember there was other people in the coaching that, like, for example, Adam. You remember Adam? Yeah. Nick and a lot of the other guys, and and they're like out of the business from what I from what I can see. 
So, so you can tell that it's an interesting what happens when you go to work. So what yeah. are you doing for your health as far as like, do you have a schedule? You go to the gym in the morning. What, what is it that you do that you're doing differently now? Because you've always been, even in yeah, the so, you, you eat healthy. Yeah, it's it's not like you're, you know. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, I was in Puerto Rico last month and obviously ate like a crazy person and drank like a fish. So when I got back, man, my stomach was bloated, like energy levels to zero. So I was like, I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna do something crazy for October, which I've never done before. So I'm doing no sugar, no carbs, and no alcohol for October. Actually, my goal is to make it all the way to Thanksgiving. And I um, actually started something called a ketogenic diet. So it's, it's pretty crazy, man. I'm, I've been 100% in on this. So I haven't, not even a hint of cheating, man. So I can definitely tell my energy levels are been pretty solid. Now, the first week was a little struggle, but you got to get past that. So I'm just trying to really focus on my health, eat better, sleep better. But gym-wise, I go every morning. You know, at least four to five days a week. First thing in the morning, I wake up and go. You know, forty-five to fifty minutes. Nothing How many like days you, a week are you doing that? <laughs> four, four to five, very consistently. That's always been that's that's always been there for the last like three or four years. Okay, so you're doing everything you're supposed to. Do. So what it, what what is what is the struggle with? It? Is a diet? Is is that is that something new? Have you done that before? I I've done the. So, keto. But I, I have struggled with that in the past. I like. Like I'm trying to get more dialed on it. These past few weeks, I've been really dialed in on it. It's mm -hmm. uh, cause I man, I know you guys know this. You know, when you eat like crap or you don't take care of yourself, you just you feel sluggish and you don't want to do the work. You don't want to make that extra phone call. You don't want right. to do a Facebook video. So it's, <clears throat> I feel like it all starts there with your physical body, and then that's it. And and, and so 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 it sounds like you're 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 ten x in your your health. Okay, so yeah. you, you, a year ago, I remember you were 10x in your business, but health wasn't even on your radar because you didn't talk about it. So, yeah, exactly. So we definitely focus that wherever our focus goes, that's energy where the growth, that's, yeah. that's where energy flows. So, so this is exciting. So, right now, I mean, for you, for you, the most important thing is to stick to your keto diet till November and then come, come Thanksgiving, you're probably going to uh, uh, break the diet a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously in the holidays and all right. So business wise, I mean, the fourth quarter for us tends to be slower. Are you preparing for that? Are you still prospecting six days a week? What yeah, are you doing so, uh, to for No, so I, I got a, I got a, yeah, I'm looking at my fourth quarter. I, I got a good amount of listings, but none of them are on the contract <laughs> or, or, or like some of them are signed up or coming on next year. So it's, uh, I hit the phones pretty hard today. I'm at 20 contacts for the day, but uh, my prospecting absolutely needs to get a little bit higher. So um, that's something I'm – actually, I just – this happened two days ago. I stopped calling expires for the past three months. And then I think I was – it was two nights ago. I was watching one of Colton's old prospecting videos. I was like, you know what? I got to get back on expires. And right then and there, I signed up for it. Um, so back in the <laughs> expire – back in the grind house. I, I love it. I love it. that's the shark tank for me. What, well, yeah, that's the what shark we do. Tank. But let me ask you. So right now, what are your business sources then? If you're not doing, if you were not doing expires for 90 days. So it was, uh, yeah. So basically five, it was, uh, cold calls, internet leads, um, you know, sphere of influence, social media and open houses. Okay. So and, and you yeah. do have a mojo group for all those guys on your calling groups. Is that what you do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mojo is my CRM. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I mean, any feedback Colton on this and so far, I mean, the, going back on the expire grind, it's like the best cause that's like the lowest hanging fruit. I so know, that's, it's... that's going to pay off dividends. Um, even if your other listings end up expiring because the market does shift, uh, yeah. I would say the cold call, my feedback would be make sure that whoever you're circle prospecting, which is what we call it, that you, I don't know what, what, what do you use for, for following up with them and nurturing wise? Um, we have a, a, a flyer system that we're, we're setting up. We have Facebook now, YouTube, that we're just starting this upcoming week. So what are you going to be doing to stay in front of those guys rather than yeah. just. Yeah. So uh, let's say I get a lead. doesn't matter the source, expired, cold call, open house. doesn't matter what the source is. So basically, obviously I have their phone numbers. I can call them. I can text them. Uh, they'll get my postcard once a month. They can get, they'll get my weekly email, which I create myself. And oh, and they'll they'll see my ads on Facebook as well. So, so you and, have a and, list, and, and right? a handwritten note too. Okay, that's like and that's within the first ninety days, first thirty days, sixty days. It, 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 you know, if a year out or two years out, it just really depends. But uh, but if I if I talk to you today on the phone and mm -hmm. you know, I want to sell next year, or my daughter graduates high school, whatever. 
you'll get the handwritten note right away. You'll start getting my postcards right away. You start getting my emails. Um, they come out every Thursday, so you start seeing that stuff right away. Well, okay. are those are those processes automated, or are you having to manually do them? They are documented, but they're not automated. I, I do it all. Like I write, I do the handwritten note myself. I send that out. The postcards, th those are automated. I don't have to worry about those. So the text uh, messages, the emails, everything is. Is the, the emails I create, I use constant contact. I create these every Thursday. I create the content myself, and, but I just create it and hit send and everybody gets it. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the retargeted Facebook ads, I do those. I usually do those every Friday and then those go out. It's a new video. Sometimes, you know, I have a, now I have a stock full of videos, so I just pick one and, you know, it goes to my, uh, my people farm. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So then that's one of the things I was going to say, make sure you incorporate the video even on yeah. the emails that you sent out. I mean, that's something that we're gonna start, it's just sending emails with video embedded in it. Um, so on your constant contact, you can add a video as well to that. It's just, you know, 20 second video, 30 second video. Have you thought about that? So I didn't know you could do a video, so I gotta look into that actually. So yeah. but that, that was a good, that's a good point. There's a- oh, Did I'm you guys sorry. see what happened that Mojo took away the mass uh, blast email, by the way? They took it away. I did. Yeah, I did see that. Well, you can only Google. to certain email addresses. What's that? Wasn't it only to certain email addresses? No, they took it away to everyone. And I asked David why. He said, out of all twenty-six thousand customers, they had only point zero nine point zero nine six percent of their customers actually using it, and the ones that were using it were abusing it. So they just they said it was a no-brainer for them to scratch it. So. We haven't used the blast a ton through Mojo anyways, but we do when we try to isolate for like our customer appreciation event. So what we did is those people we would blast through Mojo, we just took the list and then moved them into MailChimp as a list in MailChimp to blast. So just something to be aware of as you're building out this plan. Yeah, awesome. So uh, yeah, just getting, just getting dialed. I wanna finish this fourth quarter strong and super excited about 2019. Uh, well, there's a phrase we all know, it's like, my goals for 2019, I can't do what I did this year to hit my goals for next year. So, so I know a lot of things I'm going to right. change and a little bit, a lot more consistent, with a lot of avenues. So health, you know, focus, you know, you know, the hustle, the grind. So good, man. So it sounds like video would be a nice place to level up on, on your constant contact email on Thursdays, yeah. maybe even create, I mean, I, I have a lot of templates, email templates that I've downloaded over the years and yeah. I just grab and paste, you know, because I just don't have time to write them. I mean, I guess I could, but maybe you could try to automate that. And, and, um, I mean, uh, have you, know, you gone guess. through, have you gone through the attraction based marketing program? I have not, man. I, I, I have it. And I've seen like the first two or three modules, but I have not gone through the whole thing. Go through the whole thing because the video modules are going to explain the how to of what you're going to create. And then there's PDFs in there that you'll read through that give you an actual item through each one. And then there's the videos from, from Greg that go and screen share and how to and stuff. So I would, I would definitely yeah. go through that if you're building that out. All right, man, I need to finish. Yeah, I did start doing it after you and I spoke on Friday, Colton. So it's, it's been uh, very informative. Um, cool, man. So, so how, how about, you know, it's very trial early. Are you still doing your breath work and all that? What are you working on now? Yeah, so, uh, so, so my meditate, yeah, so I'm definitely still doing the Wim Hof, man. Uh, some days a little bit more intense than others. Like this morning, I was a little short on time, so I did like two super quick rounds, followed by like a seven-minute, you know, meditation. So mm -hmm. even that little bit still better than zero. And, uh, so no, I'm definitely uh, still doing it. Uh, Let me ask you this, David. Even doing that better than nothing is, is awesome. <laughs> But do you feel a little bit of guilt not doing it the full way through? Be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I do, man, because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel that way too sometimes. And remember, what is the outcome that you want from it? Is it to actually do Wim Hof? Because I, I mean, for me, I actually, I really hate doing the Wim Hof. I really hate doing the work. And that's what we're going to read in this thing today. But it's the result I love. So did you feel the result from it? It's, uh, yeah, I did. You feel right. some result. I still, still clears my head and I still get a, in a relaxed state. Right. Awesome. So remember, it's the outcome that we're looking for. Now you just know I can do it more to create and turn up that outcome. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. That was what I wanted to ask. 
Cool, man. Um, hey, so one last thing here. I know you talked about last year that um, um, your, your girlfriend was going to get into business of real estate. Is that still a thought for 2019 or no? Yeah, it's way, super way to be, to be determined. So I, I don't think that's something that will happen in 2019. She's trying to okay. get her, her career dialed in too. So maybe something in the, maybe in a few years from now, but yeah, I, I don't see it. Okay. So. so you got other focus for 2019 and that's not one of them. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Cool, man. I mean, any feedback from Denise or Colton and Shauna? Where's Shauna today, huh? Dude, she's had some some trials with uh, some flooding and some just stuff mm -hmm. that they've been dealing with in North Carolina. I checked in with her a couple of times, but they're just dealing with some cleanup from all that storm and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, for, for, you know, for me, it would be the feedback would be to start um, obviously watching the uh, attraction based model. Um, yeah. Colton and Greg. Greg has really good insight. Not that Colton does it, but Greg has really good stuff in there as well. Um, and um, that would be one thing. And number two, really, if you can start adding video to your constant contact, which I know that they allow it because a lot of I get emails through constant contact from other um, vendors, and and I know they allow it. So that would be my feedback. And yeah. uh, what do you? What else, do you guys? What do you think, Denise? What's your feedback on the? process and document that you talked about automation you can definitely consider automating um some of the stuff that you do um such as the handwritten notes also create templates you know different templates for uh different um for different prospect types and then you can integrate it into mojo and quickly send it off so that way you don't have to be spending all that time doing that work and instead you can prospect so instead of trying to hit 20 contacts a day you can do 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 would be in this market, 30 or 40 is the new norm. I mean, look, here's our, our what we're doing. I, I have Lewis, uh, he's my ISA now, he's also my brother. And what I have him do is eight to 10, he's doing fit expires and FISBOs and old cancel. We're hitting a lot of canceled. And then from 10 to 11.30, we're doing circle prospecting every single, I mean, we're doing it three days right now. And, um, and, and we're hitting, together about 45 contacts per day um, nice. in the morning. And then I do a second session in the afternoon for another 15, either door knocking or cold calling. So I'm, I'm hitting like 50 contacts without con counting Denise. So for you, maybe 30, 35, if you start calling circle prospecting, you use a three dollar, right? Three line dollar. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I cut mine down to five rings instead of seven rings. I don't know if that's something you, you want to try out just so I can get yeah. through more numbers when I'm circle prospecting. Yeah, I, I rotate between four and five. Yeah, I had it at seven. So I, I was definitely <laughs> taking a little longer, so I would cut it down yeah. to five. So, yeah. Cool, okay. Guys. The number one takeaway for you, David, is? I, I need to sit down and really finish that attraction-based, uh, you know, marketing video, so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. I'm stoked to freaking have you in person here coming up in uh, November. Yeah, man. I hope that we actually get to do it at my office, by the way. It's gonna be cutting close if they finish or not. So I'm looking for a backup venue that's at the hotel mm -hmm. where I recommended everyone stayed. So we will end up finding out what happens there. Um, do you guys have that link that I sent to you guys earlier? Yeah. Yeah, I actually uh, printed it, so. Oh, yeah. cool. So go ahead and pull that up. I, I gotta click on it myself. Um, so what I just thought is let's just kind of rotate through the paragraphs. I'll go ahead and start. And then what I want to do is just kind of have a discussion around this because I think here's, here's where I feel we are in the marketplace. I think there's a couple things to understand about where we're at in the industry. One is I think, I think we're in the older years of the industry as real estate agents. And I think we're even in the older years of this cycle that is an upswing cycle. And what I mean by that is we know that every once every eight to 10 years, we have a pretty big correction in the real estate market. And the last one we had was 2007, eight timeframe. Who, who knows what I'm talking about and can maybe remember, maybe you weren't in, in fact, you guys weren't in real estate at that time, but you can remember the way the economy was, right? You ever you remember where the economy was? Mm -hmm. so I don't know that it's a matter of if or matter, uh, more of a matter of when it's going to happen. And I don't know when that is, but absolutely for certain, I have felt a shift in the market because of what I observe with people on social media talking about with a lot of my connections, other masterminds that I participate in, just going to different events. And then even hearing local people talk about it and big producers, not just average realtors, but 
you know, number one, uh, top 1% people in my market talking about how they're downsizing their expenses right now so that they can manage their cash flow as they felt the shift at Mark. So real quick, for those of you guys here live, how many of you guys have, have truly felt or noticed a shift in the market or am I just making this up? I feel it. So let's discuss that real quick. What are you guys, what are yeah, the signs feel it, that you're seeing and feeling it? Um, so Al, what are you seeing and feeling in your marketplace? Let me tell you something. We put three under contract to fall off. Okay, so that's, that's not normal for us. We put three under contract, we would have another one, fourth one coming on board. I mean, we had a buyer walk, I mean, walk out. We even had a tenant. We, we had a property listed for sale and we decided to put it up for rent as well. And the tenant backed out. I mean, come on, it doesn't get worse than that really, which is, you know, which is not uncommon for tenants, but it's just across the board. So if we put three under contract, two will fall off. That's, that's how we're seeing it. In addition to that, we're, our listings, right now we have um, 18, 19 listings and, um, our, our, our phone should be blowing up. I should not be able to conduct this meeting on this phone right now with all those listings if my phone number's on them and, and, and the phone is not blowing up. So that's another way we're seeing it. And we're getting price reductions. By the way, we added price reductions as our weekly phone call to our sellers. Hey, it's crickets over here. We gotta start talking about the price. Let's sit down. And, and we're, we're, we're literally doing that every week. Hey, so that's some great signs to pay attention to. In fact, I had a conversation with Spring Benson, who will be at the Mastermind. She's going to be sharing her story of success. Well, really, her 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 shit show along the way. Uh, she's going to be going over. Um, but she even told me the other day that she is feeling the crunch big time. Plus, she's got a startup tech company that they're funding right now at fifty grand a month. And um, she said she feels she feels the pressure, but she understands how to shift with it. So that comes from a big producer. Denise, how about you from your perception? And I know you work with Alan, obviously you see a lot of, of other things. What do you notice? Our listings are sitting on the market for a lot longer than we expected them to. I mean, we go in, we price them right. And, Colton is muted. and there's, there's no activity. Um, you know, the, the sellers are getting frustrated and the buyers are not wanting to pay what, supposedly is market value um obviously we can tell that it, the prices are going to start i don't know if the market's regulating or if you know it scares me though yeah don't don't here's i'm glad you brought that up that it scares you think about this is it um when we were doing the breath work in new orleans and we were really getting into the midst of it. Did it get a little bit scary for anyone else in the middle of it or a little bit like, I don't know, like, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. Or is it all like, what's good? You know what I mean? You could, did anyone else get a little thrown off during the breath work or was it just me? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think this is our opportunity to either to really embrace the kind of fear that comes from this type of market and then just hit it head on. So just like Al and, and you said that the listings are taking longer to sell and then a couple of them are falling out of contract, Rob Andre, who's a really good friend of mine, he probably does 50 deals a year here in our market, really good producer. I went to the gym with him Monday night. He said, I just can't fucking figure it out because I'm, it's the weirdest shit, like past clients that I think are in the bag. You know, he told me a scenario of he's doing this divorce listing and he met with him. He thought everything was fine. Next thing you know is the husband's calling him saying, dude, my ex-wife is flipping out and we're listing with someone else. Like it's just some radical story, but the moral is, moral is he didn't get the listing. And he says more and more just weird shit is happening like that or weird deals falling out, right? So it's happening everywhere. And, and notice the little voice that comes up that causes us to feel a little afraid or a little scared. All that is is a fucking chatter in our brain and we get to choose to silence it or not. Does that make sense? David, what are you noticing? So, so one thing I really noticed, uh, so I stopped calling expired. I think the last time I called them was August 9th that I just signed up two nights ago and I can see it's doubled expired than they were in August. So that's a huge change right there. We were getting like one to two a day. And now it's like four to five a day. So I see that. And then uh, obviously showing some some it's funny how some neighborhoods they were getting the bidding wars in the spring and early summer now they're sitting on the market no no, no bidding war no no uh jacking up the price 
So I'm definitely seeing that. And just like you guys, showings have been some listings, showings are close to nothing. Days in the market has absolutely increased. So days on market, here, I want to write these down. Let's make a list of these and then I'm going to post them later. So how, how often do you guys, and I, I know I'm going to flash the, I love my love journal, but you probably use it all up or have a journal that you have by you all the time writing in. Do you guys have that with you? Yeah. Always be writing. So let's, t let's make, so I use my notepad on my phone, but yeah, I do that. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Ah, sweet. So right. listings on the market longer. Deals, weird deals falling out of contract. Yeah. Did you say more yeah. expires coming on the market, David? Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you this. I, I, we send out with door knock expires and for a while we've door knocked them and brought them a packet. When I send out a packet now, the people said I've had three or four people stop by. So there's more uh, agents, I want to say, sort of like out there scrambling, trying to get a deal. Even though we've done this forever, now I'm seeing more um, of these agents out there, you know. And the same thing with even even Chris, you know, David, like, you know, I'm sure he works really hard. But, um, yeah. you know, you, you know you're, I'm sure he's working double as hard too, right? So, uh, you know, to get the same amount of deals. So you're seeing a little bit more phone calls, a little bit more people showing up at the door. I guess for that same reason that people are trying to scavenger, you know? Yeah. Cool. So didn't you even mention that you see bigger producers doing open houses now? Oh, More open. Yeah. yeah. Even Chad Gallagher, he's, he's blowing up with those and he never, he's never, he doesn't do them. I get two or three emails a day now of him doing those. Yeah. What else are you guys seeing that you guys brought up that I didn't write down so far? Buyers are backing out of deals. Yeah, and, I got, you know, buyers are, uh, what, the buyers they, are afraid to pull the trigger. Buyers afraid to pull the trigger. Yeah, because they feel like we're at the top of the market and they, they don't want to be like people who bought in 06. Yeah. And they're um, also hearing people saying the market is too, you're going to correct or something. They're hearing that now too. Rates are up. Um, so buyers are hearing that conversation. Hey, I hear that the market's going going down by next march i had a lady tell me yesterday that she's looking for two million dollar property in the area she wasn't expired and she said that her attorney told her the market's gonna crash in march i'm so fucking glad he has a crystal ball i need to meet this guy <laughs> <laughs> i also wrote down rates are up because they are yeah. prices are up so that's obviously a sign Number of realtors in our in licensed agents are big time up. Mm -hmm. But what correlation does that have? There's well, more more sharks in the ocean eating the chum. So because it's been so hot, is a lot of them have come on the market, right? Okay. It's been I wrote this down ten years since we had the last major shift. I think that's an important sign. Some of the signals for me are as I hear more talk about it nationwide. Oh yeah. Yeah. Local and nationwide. Anything else that stuck out? So the signs are all over. We could probably go on with the list. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 things I wrote down. But the question is, is if we see these signs are happening, I want to relate it to um, the hurricane that came through Florida last year, right? What was the name of that one, Henry or, or Eric or Irma? Or Irma, I was way off. Hurricane Irma, right? And, you, and I will use that example because you, Al, and Denise were there, and you've been through some hurricanes there. But you could use the one that happened in Houston. You could use the, the storm that just went through, you know, North South Carolina. But my question is, is you, did you know the storm was coming? Yeah. Was there anything you could do to stop the storm? No. So you know that it's coming, you know that it's happening and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But were there things you could do to prepare for it and to work through it? Yeah. So that's, that's what we want to talk about because we know the storm is coming. 
if the market shift is coming. In fact, we feel it happening. And my personal opinion is I don't think that I don't think this is going to be some devastating sky is falling. It's the end of the world. I actually, one of the reasons I just talked to David England, because earlier this year they were seeing more people default on their credit cards, but he says that and it, it's up maybe 3% this year, but he said, this is their strongest year of new customers come on the market. Um, and he also said their retention has stayed about the same of voluntary councils, but he liked it to the example of, a two-stroke motorbike. And I don't know if you guys have ever rode two-stroke motorcycles. That's what I rode when I was a kid. Now everyone has four strokes. So they're a little different. But a two-stroke is as they were running at their peak performance just before the motor would blow. They were running lean. They were running mean. You could just hear it screaming and hitting the power bands as you'd come out of the, the banks in the corner and it would just rip open. And then that's exactly when it was just in its finest tuned running spot is when the motor would blow. So David hopes that that's not the case, but he gave that analogy to say, hey, listen, I think as a realtor, there's way too many in there for too few ch chums, and you really have to differentiate yourself now more than ever. This is, he's got 26,000 customers with inside of their company, okay? So what I want to be able to do is I want to read through this, this thing that we're, or this article we're going to go through, and I want us to come up with key strategies that we can put into place that will absolutely make certain that we do everything we can to just deal with the, the blown motor or the shifting market or the hurricane that's coming through. And that's, um, does that sound like fair enough? Like a good thing to do here right now? Good? Okay, so pull it up on your phone or your whatever you got it on. I'll start and then let's just rotate through the, the paragraphs and then we'll have a discussion about it. So the common denominator of success, mm -hmm. The secret of success of every man who has ever been successful lies in the fact that he formed the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. I think that's a huge signal already for us. We're going to have to do even more of the stuff we don't like to do in the hurricane. Do you like sandbagging in the hurricane? No. Do you like poking all your stuff up off the floor and making sure that it doesn't get flooded out? No. Do you like driving 18 hours to Atlanta to make sure you're not there when the hurricane hits? No, you don't like that stuff, but you have to do it in order to be successful. You guys with me here? The common denominator of success mm -hmm. is timely and inspirational as it was when it was first delivered in 1940, though it was written for life insurance professionals, the, its message is equally well suited to everyone in the sales profession or anyone in the field or endeavor who seeks success in their professional or personal or spiritual lives. Uh, who would like to read the next paragraph? All right. All right, go ahead. Message. This inspiring message by. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, babe. No. Oh, okay, you're so up. This you're is, and this inspiring message. Yeah. Yeah. This inspiring message by Mr. Gray is one of the most timeless pieces of life insurance literature. It first appeared as a major address at the 1940 Na National Association of Life Underwriting underwriters annual convention in Philadelphia and has been available to association members and pamphlet from ever since. Although our author had passed away, his words of wisdom and moving philosophy so manifest in the common denominator of success are part of the current life insurance scene and have real need for today's professional life underwriter. Mr. Gray was an official of the Prudential Insurance Company of America and had 30 years of continuous experience both as an agent in the field and as a promoter and instructor in sales development. He was known throughout the country as a writer and speaker on live insurance subjects. I'll read this. Several years ago, I was brought face to face with a very disturbing realization that I was trying to supervise and direct the efforts of a large number of men who were trying to achieve success without knowing myself what the secret of success really was. And that naturally brought me face to face with the further realization that regardless of what other knowledge I might have brought to my job, I was definitely lacking in the most important knowledge of it all. Wait, wait, before we move on, so what are some key takeaways from that? Um, well, I mean, I, I, mean <laughs> I mean, really, that, that whatever, it was in 1940s clearly still is the same case now, which is hard work, you know, which is, I think he's going to talk about that a little bit now too, uh, yep. working hard and all that stuff. Cool. Um, 
I think what yeah. you're saying is that hard work so, is really common knowledge might be wrong. Yeah. So, so hard work might be part of the common denominator that has to happen, mm -hmm. but there's something a little bit more than just hard work because how many of you guys know a lot of agents right now that are working hard that aren't getting results? Who's with me here? Say yes. Yeah. Right. So sure. hard work is required, but it's not yeah. the only or the most important key element in success. All right. Let's go to the next, the next one. I'll go, I'll go ahead. So, uh, all right. And, and so I set out on a voyage of discovery. Of course. Which carried... I think. No, oh, so am I might not, of course, sorry about that. Yeah. Of course, like most of us, I had been brought up on a popular belief that the secret of success is hard work. But I had seen so many men work hard without succeeding, and so many men succeed without working hard, that I had become convinced that hard work was not the real secret, even though in most cases, it might be one of the requirements. I'll read the next one. And so I set out on the voyage of discovery, which carried me through biographies and autobiographies of all sorts of uh, dissertations on success and the lives of successful men, until I finally reached a point at which I realized that the secret I was trying to discover lay not only in what men did, but also in what made them do it. But I'll read the next one. I realized further that the secret for which I was searching must not only apply to every definition of success, but since it must apply to everyone to whom it was offered, it must also apply to everyone who had ever been successful. In short, I was looking for a common denominator of success. So I kind of jumped the gun by saying that, but hard work, there's a lot of people that worked hard and didn't have the success, but a lot of people that didn't necessarily work hard and did have success. Although it might be required, there was some, some other common denominator. You want to keep reading there, Denise? Yeah. Um, okay. And because? Yeah. And because that is exactly what I was looking for, that is exactly what I found. But the common de denominator of success is so big, so powerful, and so vitally important to, the, to your future and mine that I'm not going to make a speech about it. I'm not, I'm just going to lay it all on the line in words of one syllable so, so that everyone can understand them. The common denominator of success, the secret of success of every man who has ever been successful, lies in the fact that he formed the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. It's just as true as it sounds, and it's just as simple as it seems. You can hold it up to the light, you can put it to the acid test, you can kick it around until it's worn out, but when you are all through with it, it will still be the common denominator of success, whether you like it or not. Awesome. So whether we like it or not, it is the common denominator, sorry, common denominator of success. <laughs> Okay, uh, make sure I'm on the, the right one. It will still explain why men have come into this business of ours with every apparent qualification for success and given us our most disappointing failures. While others have come in and achieved outstanding success in spite of many obvious and discouraging handicaps, and since it will also explain the future, it would seem to be very like, um, be, sorry, it would seem to be very, be a mighty good idea for you to use in determining just what sort of future you are going to have. In other words, let's take this big all-embracing secret and boil it down to fit individual, to fit individual you. Sorry, my daughter's banging on something. Hey, hey, relax. The things that, that failures, oh wait, I, I missed the wrong one. If the secret of success lies in forming the habit of, of doing things that failures don't like to do, let's start with boiling down the process by determining what are the things that failures don't like to do. The things that failures don't like to do are the very things that you and I and other human beings, including successful men, naturally don't like to do. In other words, we've got to realize right from the start that success is something which is achieved by a majority of men and is therefore unnatural and not to be achieved by following our natural likes or dislikes, nor by being guided by our natural preferences and prejudices. That's so freaking powerful mm -hmm. for me powerful. because success is not whether we like to do the thing or not like to do. In fact, most men and women don't like to do the thing that causes success. Most men and women don't like to do the work required through breath work to get the peace and tranquility that comes from it. Most men and women don't like to call expireds or FISBOs, but for to get the results of five listings this month or whatever it is. You guys with me here? 
Okay, who wants to go next? I got a, I got a jump on. Yeah. Oh, okay, the things that failures don't like to do in general are too obvious for us to discuss them here. And so since our success is to be achieved in the sale of life insurance, let us move on to discuss of the things that we as life insurance men don't like to do. Here, too, the things we don't like to do are too many to permit specific discussion. But I think they can all be disposed of by saying that they all emanate from one basic dislike peculiar to our type of selling. We don't like to call on people who don't want to see us and talk to them about something they don't want to talk about. And reluctance to follow a definite prospecting program to use prepared sales talk to organize time and to organize effort are all caused by this one basic dislike. You want me to read the next one? Yeah. Perhaps you have wondered what is behind this peculiar lack of welcome on the part of our prospective buyers. Isn't it due to the fact that our prospects are human too? And isn't it true that the average human being is not be big enough to buy life insurance of his own accord and is therefore prone to escape our efforts to make him bigger or persuade him to do something he doesn't want to do by striking at the most important weakness we possess, namely our desire to be appreciated. Perhaps you have been discouraged by a feeling that you were born subject to certain dislikes peculiar to you, with which the successful men in our business are not afflicted. That's powerful for me. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's like, we, we're all the same. That's what this tells me. Yeah. Cool. Nice. All right. In, in the sense of like dislikes and likes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You know, that was one thing I always thought interesting with like um, Jeremy on my team. He was always trying to succeed through what he liked and dude, this is plain and simple to read. And this is timeless. Like this isn't just this week we heard this. This, is, this has been going on since 1940. It's doing the things we don't like. Cool. All right, I'll go. Perhaps you have wondered why is it that our biggest producers seem to like to do what things you don't like to do. They don't. And I think this is the most encouraging statement I have ever offered to a group of life insurance salesmen. But if they don't like to do these things, then why do they do them? Because by doing the things they don't like to do, they can accomplish the things they want to accomplish. Successful men are influenced by the desire for pleasing results. Failures are influenced by the desire for pleasing the methods and are inclined to be satisfied with such results as can be obtained by doing things they like to do. Why are successful men able to do things they don't like to do while failures are not? because successful men have a purpose strong enough to make them form the habit of doing things they don't like to do in order to accomplish the purpose they want to accomplish. I'm going to keep going. Paraphrase mm -hmm. that for us real quick before mm -hmm. you keep paraphrase that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically saying these successful men, like people think like we use it for us. Like they, people might see us calling expires or fit bulls. And the average agent may think we like doing it just because we do it. But, you know, we don't. We do it because it gives us the result that we're looking for. But we still don't like to do it, but we do it anyway. But failures, they're not going to do it because they don't like to do it. They want, like, like you said, your guy, he was trying to prospect, but prospect ways that he likes to do. But we, we basically, you know, you're going to get the best results from doing things that you don't like to do. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, though. Um, I actually like calling. Um, I'm probably like an anomaly, but I get energy, I get energy from calling. I really do like that stuff. Um, the dislike probably comes in the discomfort of the standing, being on the phone a long time, pushing through that, you know, that's the part that, that I dislike, but doing it when I'm energetic and ready to go, I'm, I'm all fired up, you know? For sure, when you're in the midst of it. And uh, did you leave off as the next one? Um, sometimes even our best producers get into a slump. Yeah, I, I can do that. No, so here, I'll read it. But this is, I want to make sure I was on the right one. But this is where it gets juicy, guys. I love this. Sometimes even our best producers get into a slump. When a man goes into a slump, it simply means that he reached a point at which, for the time being, the things he doesn't like to do have become more important than his reason for doing them. And may I pause to suggest to managers and general agents, listen here, this even works for ourselves, that when one of your good producers goes into a slump, 
the less you talk about the production and the more you talk about his purpose, the sooner you will pull him out of his slump. Notice that. The less you talk about the production and the more you talk about his purpose. Many men with whom I have discussed the common denominator of success have said at this point, but I have, but I have a family to support and I have a, um, a living for my family. And my, I have to, I have to, what does it say? Support. And I have to have a living for my family and myself. Isn't that enough of a purpose? No, it isn't. It isn't a sufficiently strong purpose to make you form the habit of doing things you don't like to do for the very simple reasons that it's easier to adjust ourselves to the hardships of poor living than it is to adjust ourselves in the hardships of making a better one. If you doubt me, just think of all the things you are willing to go do, go without in order to avoid doing the things you don't like to do. All of which seems to prove that the strength which holds you to the purpose is not your own strength, but the strength of the purpose itself. Now let's see why habit belongs so importantly in the common denominator of success. Paraphrasing is you want to do the shit that you don't want to do. To do the shit you don't want to do, get your drive, get your purpose, get your excitement. Yeah. Your enthusiasm comes from you making that choice and you have to choose it. So what drives you so flipping much? What are you so obsessed with that you're willing? Think about this, Al. Why are you so much more focused and obsessed and willing to prospect today versus what was it two or three months ago? Yeah, dude, I'm like a different person. I mean, I'm not going to lie about that. Um, I am fucking doing it like hardcore. And I just, I don't, I, I need certainty, quite frankly. I need to make sure that I get, I can push through any fucking, and it's, I mean, I've been through tough times, it doesn't fucking matter. I just know that I got to do it. That's why, because I got to do it. There's just, 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 I got to do it. It's like the family, myself, there's, there's just no option. That's, that's the reason why I told him. There's just no You said the word that I love, and I think this is what creates, so Denise said the word, it's kind of scary. You yeah. said the word, it's because it gives me certainty, right? right? So the certain, like, for example, and, and my team, we had this discussion today is my life and my schedule has transformed dramatically since my divorce. My kids are, I mean, my kids are with me today. And mm -hmm. so I'm having to produce the same amount of results I was producing before, but in three and a half to four days a week, right? So that's, that's, that was a little scary when I was like yeah. starting to get this realization, like, fuck, I got less time to do more shit. But that certainty was like, I don't care. I'm going to find a way to be there for a dad for them and to be there for the business and to create even more results. I will freaking find a way and make it happen. And that purpose, that drive that I'm going to make a difference and make it happen and you know what? I used to think, because I love to make a difference. That's the whole message for the WGR. I told you guys that before. And I, I love making a difference for you, for the team, for my clients. But the drive deeper than that is to freaking be the number one example for my kids. Me and you have talked about this out, right? There's not going to be a bigger influence for my kids in their life than I am. Yeah. And because of my current situation, that's been part of my concern is like, what beliefs are they developing when they're with their mom versus with me? And that has been the drive for me to find a way to make it happen and put it all into play. So it's just like, what is that for you? What is your purpose? What is that certainty? And get hungry and get obsessed for it. And sometimes we don't know what that purpose is until we obsessively talk about it. We obsessively work on it. We obsessively write our journal about it. And then one day it'll hit us. It'll just hit us like a ton of bricks. Cool. Who wants to read next? That's right on. Uh, men are creatures of habit just as machines are creatures of momentum. For habit, it's nothing more or less than momentum translated from the concrete into the abstract. Can you picture the problem that would face our mechanical engineers if there were, if there were no such thing as momentum? Speed would be impossible because the highest speed at which any vehicle would move would be the first speed at which it could be broken away from a standstill. Elevators could not be made to rise. Airplanes could not be made to fly and the entire world of mecha mechanics would find itself in a total state of helplessness, then who are you and I to think that we can do without our own human nature that the finest engineers in the world could not do with the finest machinery that was ever built? That's powerful. Yeah. How much easier is it for a plane to cruise at five, 600 miles an hour when they're at 32,000 feet versus when they're on the runway? Why is that? 
they got the momentum going. They can't go to 500 miles an hour like that. Neither can you, neither can we, right? But they got started in that. Isn't that so powerful? The momentum built off of that. Yeah, that's huge. Wow. So the momentum is really, um, you know, it's like physiologically, like, like it, it's funny. I never thought of it like that, really. Think about this too. How could momentum actually work against us? Think about if we're doing, if we're not doing the things that we don't like to do, like if we're not calling expireds or FISBOs, or if we're not getting out of bed early, or if we're not doing it, how, momentum there too. the momentum that direction could swallow us up and spit us out. Right? Yeah. That's a good point. I had never thought of it that way. Maybe even shit us out. You guys, if you guys read that book, the strangest secret. I know you have, Al. Have you read The Strangest Secret, David? I have no. Earl Nightingale? Yeah. 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 I haven't. No. I, I've seen his little 30 minute video about The Strangest Secret, but I've never it's read It's probably the, book. the same thing. It's probably him yeah. reading the book, right? But check it out. There's you can two. Yeah, yeah, there's a nice PDF, but I listen to it all the time. Yeah, you can find it online for free uh, or buy the book for like three bucks or something or the audio, right? But in there, he talks about the, the nightshade right? You know, the nightshade is like a nasty weed. I want, I used to think abundance only meant positive, but whether you pour, and I think he talks about this in here, I can't remember, but if you pour water on the ground, when there's a plant there, the, 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 the weeds are going to grow just as much as the plant is going to grow because it absorbs water. In fact, if you plant a nightshade, it will nightshade, if you planted poison ivy, it would grow abundantly if you nurtured it and if you focused on it and you gave it water and you gave it sun and you gave it nutrients. I mean, think about if you grew a field of poison ivy, could you not abundantly grow that? So mm -hmm. for me, it's not just about being abundant, it's being consciously abundant. What am I going to be abundant about? What am I going to be consciously creating and focusing? You get me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Who wants to go next? I'll go. All right. I hope in the right, yeah. Every, every single qualification for success is acquired through habit. Men form habits and habits form futures. If you do not deliberately form good habits, then unconsciously you'll form bad ones. You're the kind of man you are because you have formed the habit of being that kind of man. And the only way you can change it is to have it. The success, the success habits of life insurance selling are divided into four main groups. Prospecting habits, calling habits, selling habits, working habits. That's real estate right there, man. <laughs> so <laughs> but let's discuss these habit groups in the, their order. Any successful life insurance salesman will tell you that it is easier to sell life insurance to people who don't want it than it is to find people who do want it. But if you have not deliberately formed the habit of prospecting for needs, regardless of wants, then unconsciously you have formed the habit of limiting your prospecting to people who want life insurance and their lines, the one and only reason for lack of uh, prospects. And <laughs> That's like going. expired versus circle prospecting. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny because we just, we literally just got intentional about circle prospecting three weeks ago. Right. We've done, we've done really well with the lowest hanging fruit for a while. Right. And, and how, how funny is it if, they, if we only relied on that, what would our business be? You know, I fell into that trap too, only relying on FISBOs in 2012. And I did a bunch of business, but I burned out from it. I got burned out from it and I didn't build a database from it. Not to say don't call mm -hmm. FISBOs. Definitely we must, but we also must call the experience. We also must call the circle prospecting cold calling. Mm -hmm. yes. Very true. Where did we leave off? Any habits. successful? Let's um, discuss these habit groups in their order. You want to continue, Colton? You want me to do it? Uh, I'll do it. Let's let's let. No, didn't he just read that? We went through. Yeah, I read that part. So I think we're at as to calling as, habits. As to calling habits, unless you have deliberately formed a habit of calling on people who are a, who are able to buy but willing to listen. Um, the unconsciously you have formed that habit of calling on people who are willing to listen but able to, un, unable to buy. As to selling habits, unless you have deliberately formed a habit of calling on prospects determined to make them 
see their reasons for buying life insurance, then unconsciously you have formed the habit of calling on prospects in a state of mind of which you are willing to let them make see, you see their reasons for not buying. Isn't that funny? How often are we getting good at FISBOs or expires or people that are thinking of buying and selling actually sell us on this idea that they don't need a realtor to meet with right now? Who's been sold on that before? We're just looking or we're not ready or whatever. Next thing you know, they got a sign in their yard. True or true? Very true. Yeah. As, as to working habits, if you will take care of the other three groups, the working habits will generally take care of themselves because under the work habits are included study and preparation, organization of time and efforts, records, analysis. Certainly you're not going to take the trouble to learn interest arousing approaches and sales talks unless you're going to use them. You're not going to plan your day's work when you know in your heart that you're going to carry out your, you're not going to carry out your plans. Think about that. Why even do an RPM? Because I'm not going to fucking do it anyways. I don't even need to sit down and create that. I'm not going to do it. You're not going to plan your day's work when you know in your heart you're not going to do the plan. And you're certainly not going to keep an honest record of things you haven't done or results you haven't achieved. So let's not worry so much about the fourth group of success habits. For if you are taking care of the first three groups, most of the working habits will take care of themselves. And you'll be able to afford a secretary to take care of the rest of them for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joked with autumn today because she one of her folks is now she had a shit week last week of like 36 contacts and i'm like what the hell were you doing dude like did you even show up for work last week like we were joking in the meeting but serious and then one of the things that we have her focusing on now is setting up breakthrough calls to for for our wg academy business and then to offer products for them and today she sent me a message she said i just set up one free breakthrough call then she sent me another one, just set up a second one. And then like 30 minutes later, she's like, I just set up a third one. And in the team meeting, I said, you know what's funny, Autumn? You didn't text me one time last night being stoked that you didn't set any appointments. You didn't say, hey, Colton, guess what? I just didn't set an appointment, right? And it kind of reflects here. We don't care to track our numbers when we ain't doing a damn thing. It's when we're doing them that we get excited, right? Anything else on this before we move on? Okay. Okay. Who wants to go next? All right, I'll go. All right, I hope I'm in a bright spot. But before you decide to adopt these success habits, let me warn you of the importance of a habit to your decision. I have attended many sales meetings and sales congresses during the past 10 years and have often wondered why, in despite of the fact that there is so much good in them, so many men seem to get so little lasting good out of them. Perhaps you have attended sales meetings in the past and have left determined due to things that would make you successful or more successful only to find your decision or determination waning at just the time when you should be putting in the effort or practice. Here's the answer. Any resolution or decision you make is a simple, simply a promise to yourself, which isn't worth a ticker's damn unless you have formed a habit of making it and keeping it. And you won't form the habit of making it and keeping it unless right at the start, you link it with a definite purpose that can be accomp accomplished by keeping it. In other words, any resolution or decision you make today has to be made again tomorrow and the next day and the next and the next and so on. And it not only has to be made each day, but it has to be kept each day. For if you miss a day in making or keeping of it, you've got to go back and begin all over again. But if you continue the process of making it each morning and keeping it each day, you will finally wake up some morning a different man in a different world, and you will wonder what has happened to you and the world you used to live in. So, so that's so that's so funny. That's just like making the decision to like start start calling expires or fizzbos. But uh, you have to make that decision every day, every day, every day, and today habit forms. So it's, it's very true. And it talks yeah. about going to those sales. You always come back all fired up, but uh, that's not enough. You got to make a decision. Amen to that. What was the what? When did you leave off on? Here's here's what has um, happened. Your resolution yeah. or decision has become a habit, and you don't have to make it on this particular morning. And the reason for your seeming like a like a like a different man living in a different world lies in the fact that for the first time in your life you have become master of yourself and master of your likes and dislikes by surrendering to your purpose in life. 
That is why behind every success, there must be a purpose. And that is what makes purpose so important to your future. For in the last analysis, your future is not going to depend on economic conditions or outside influences or circumstances over which you have no control. Your future is going to depend on your purpose in life. So let's talk about purpose. First of all, your purpose must be practical and visionary. Some of time ago, some of the time ago, where did I go? Well, some time ago, I talked with a man who thought it had, he had a purpose of which was more important to him than income. He was interested in the sufferings of his fellow man, and then he wanted to be placed in a position to ele- alleviate the suffering. But when he analyzed his real feeling, we discovered and he admitted that what he really wanted was a real nice job dispensing charity with other people's money and being well paid for it, along with the appreciation and feeling of importance that would naturally go with such a job. But in making your purpose practical, be careful not to make it logical. Make it a purpose of sentimental or emotional type. Remember, needs are logical while wants are desires and sentimental and emotional. Your needs will push you just so far. But when your needs are satisfied, they will, they will stop p- pushing you. If, however, your purpose is in terms of wants or desires, then your wants and desires will keep pushing you long after your needs are satisfied and until your wants and desires are fulfilled. Recently, I was talking with a young man who long ago discovered the common denominator of success without identifying the his discovery. He had a definite purpose in life. Notice that word, definite purpose. Who else talks about definite purpose? Napoleon Hill yeah. talks about that. He had a definite purpose in life, and it was definite sentimental or emotional purpose. He wanted to, his boy to go throughout the college without having to work his way through as he had done. He wanted to avoid for his little girl, the hardships of his own sister had to face in her childhood. He wanted his wife and the mother of his children to enjoy the luxuries, comforts, and necessities which had been denied in his own mother. And he, will, he was willing to form the habits of doing things he didn't like to do in order to accomplish these purpose. This was one that I thought was very interesting. Not to discourage him, but rather that to have him encourage me, I asked him, aren't you going to a little too far with this thing? There's no logical reason why your son shouldn't be willing to be able to work his way through college just as his father did. Of course, he'll miss many of the things that you missed in your college life, and he'll probably have the headaches and disappointments of he's, if he's any good, he'll come through, hold on one second. And the things he missed in college, but if he's any good, he'll come through in the end just as you did. And there's no logical reason why you should have to slave in order that your daughter may be may have the things which your own sister wasn't able to have. Or in order your wife to enjoy the comforts and luxuries she wasn't used to before she was married. Hey, Al, will you read that next part? Yeah. He looked at me with rather uh, a pitting look and said, but Mr. Gray, there's no inspiration in logic. There's no courage in logic. There's not even happiness in logic. There's only satisfaction. The only place logic has in my life is in the realization that the more I am willing to do for my wife and children, the more I shall be able to do for myself. Imagine, after hearing that story, you won't have to be told how to find your purpose or how to identify it or how to surrender to it. If it's a big purpose, you will be big in its accomplishment. And if it's an unselfish purpose, you will be unselfish in accomplishing it. You want to finish it, David? Yeah. And if it's an honest purpose, you will be honest and honorable in the accomplishment of it. But as long as you live, don't ever forget that while you may succeed beyond your fondest hopes, with your greatest expectations, you will never succeed beyond the purpose of which you are willing to surrender. Furthermore, your surrender will not be complete until you have formed the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Nice. This powerful, powerful stuff, man. This was a great little... It was a great, this great... Is why, this is great why I wanted to read excerpt. it today. How it freaking timely is that with what's going on? The market has been good for a long time and it's been easy to be okay with not doing the things you don't like to do but it's those that do the things they don't like to do going through this market shift that are gonna not only survive but thrive. i don't know about you guys i don't want to just survive over the next three months to six months i want to thrive true or true so key takeaways number one what was your number one takeaway from today's conversation Habits Basically, this right here, habits and you form habits and doing things that I don't like to do and that the, the average agent doesn't want to do. So, which we're doing most of it, but there's, there's definitely more I can do. 
For sure. And notice the part, and this, this kind of made me laugh, where he said, you do those first three habits and you'll be able to pay a secretary to take care of the rest. Yeah. Right? How often do we get stuck doing the secretary work versus doing the stuff we don't like? Right. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. Any other takeaways? You know, just revisit the purpose. Revisit the purpose. I think that's, I'm glad you brought that, brought that up. How often are you guys revisiting your purpose? Revisiting your drive? Revisiting writing your targets down in your journal? Yeah, beyond the target. Yeah. Right. And you know what? That target, the target is our choice. It, that flag on the hill, we place there. You notice the average agents, they're not hitting their targets. It's not because they don't have them. But oftentimes is they'll set the target up on the hill, but then they'll never look at it again. Mm -hmm. They won't get obsessed over it over and over again. Think about the habit of obsessing over your target. Think about if you obsessively focused on that. I, the other night I was working till 1130 and obviously my life's a little bit different than your guys' life. Um, and so I, I don't ever expect anyone to work till 1130 at night, but I talked with my team about this and they asked me, well, why were you working until 1130 at night? And I said, well, what else do I got to fucking do besides live my dream? Besides to go after what I'm hungry for? Sit down and watch fucking Netflix? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing else more important to me than to spend my time just eating up what I'm hungry for. Same reason why I go to the gym every single day or even when I'm with my girls, I find out a way to do a core exercise at my home because I'm hungry for my number one value which is health and vitality you get what i'm saying right here so we have to just obsessively hunger and feed on our targets on what we're going after that's a pretty when we think about it that way if you were obsessed with your purpose would you have any challenge doing what you didn't like to do zero it right matter and if we're not doing what we don't like to do it's because we're not focusing on our purpose it's that. It's that simple. Yeah, very true. Okay, guys. Appreciate you. Let me know what I can do to support you. Talk to you here soon. All right, boys. Awesome. Peace. See you guys. All right.